Okay, so today we're carrying on looking at the three angels' messages. Um, and we're up to uh, chapter 14, verse 9, looking at the third angel's message, the final of these three messages of the everlasting gospel. We start in Revelation 14, verse 9. Let me read. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, this third message um, has a different tone to the previous two. Okay. There is lots in here about fire and brimstone, about being tormented forever and ever, night and day, having no rest. There's a lot of things about this message that make some people to, to be scared of what's happening. It, it seems like almost a different God has stepped in, a God of, of vengeance, of adjustments, that, that, that is speaking these things to scare people. But that is not the purpose of this message. This message is a warning. And a, a warning by definition has to be warning us of something scary. Because if there wasn't something scary or something dangerous, why would we need a warning? But the purpose of giving us the warning is not so we can be scared of the things to come, but so we can be safe from it. And that is an important um, distinction to make. This message, although it has things that may seem scary, the purpose is not to make us scared, it's to make us safe. And I want to give an example with a, a couple of signs that I found that we use here. Um, the, the first one on this side, danger, landmines. Stay alive, stay out. Now, um, when I was over in Israel, we were touring some places, and there were signs where they had danger, landmine signs. And if you're reading a sign like this, there's a couple of things you know. First of all, where you are is safe. And on the other side of that sign is danger. The sign is put there as a warning. And the warning tells us where is the difference between what is safe and what is dangerous. Okay? That sign is not given so we can be scared of what's on the other side of it. It's so we can be safe on this side of the warning. And then this, uh, this second sign here that I found, um, there was a, a caption under it when I found it that originally it just had this warning up here, danger high voltage. But when the inspector came along, he says, no, that's not a big enough sign, okay? There's high voltage here, it's dangerous. You need a bigger warning to match with the danger that is present. And so the construction manager put up this sign, danger. Not only will this kill you, it will hurt the whole time you'll die. And so what I want to point out here is this, because the danger was real, the small sign was not enough. If there is a real danger, you need a real warning. Both these signs are put there because there is a real danger. And they're not put there so we can be scared of the danger, but so we can be safe from it. And that is the nature of a warning. It's not so we can be scared, it's so we can be safe. And the size of the warning needs to match the size of the danger. And I just want to give one more example with a, a story, something happened to me. When I was living over in, in Kurenbong in Australia, my boy was two, um, almost three. And this year, the mosquitoes were particularly bad. Um, and, and we were out, I can't remember if we were just going for a walk or something, but um, my boy got at least 12 mosquito bites on him this one evening. And he was not happy, okay? A two-year-old with 12 mosquito bites all over his body. Um, 
was very upsetting to her. Okay, but as happens, mosquito bites disappear after a while. And then a couple of weeks later, we were out in the garden. And I was gardening away. He was out there with me picking strawberries and eating them, um, just finding what bugs he could exploring. But the sun started to set. And as the sun set, it started getting cool and the mosquitoes started coming out. And so I told him, it's time to go inside. But he didn't want to leave. He wanted to stay there and have more fun in the garden. So I gave him the warning. I said, we need to go inside because the mosquitoes are coming out. And as soon as I gave him that warning, his eyes went wide, his mouth went open, his arms went up. And he said to me, pick me up, pick me up. And I picked him up. And then he said, run inside, run inside. And I took him inside, we got inside. And he said, shut the door, shut the door. And so I shut the door. And as soon as the door was shut, he said, bitey, stay outside, bitey, stay outside. When I gave my son that warning, okay, he was actually scared, okay? Because he remembered what it was like last time the mosquitoes were out. And he had to go for a week with 12 mosquito bites all over his body. Okay, so his eyes were wide, he was scared. But he, in, in his um, fear, in, in that being scared of what was to come, okay, how did he respond? He lifted his arms up to his father who could carry him to safety. Now, when I gave him that warning, I didn't want him to be scared. I wanted him to be safe. And I knew I was able to take him to safety so he didn't have to get a single mosquito bite. But the very nature of the warning was something that scared him. But that warned him, warning led him to be safe. But even more so than being safe, it led him to come to the one who could carry him to safety. And, and that is what we need in this time that is before us, in this time that this third angel's message speaks about. It gives us these warnings, these strong warnings, these powerful warnings so we can be safe, but more so, so we can be brought to the one who is able to carry us through this time and lead us to safety. Now, this is the, the third angel's message, that the warning found in the third angel's message can be broken into these four parts. And I find it interesting, at, at the beginning, it opens up, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, it identifies the thing that we're warning about. It clearly identifies the danger. Worshipping the beast at his image and receiving his mark. It's the first thing it tells us. Then at the end of the warning, it said, talks about all those who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So it, the warning opens and closes by identifying the thing that God is trying to warn us against. It very clearly identifies these. And then in the middle, there are two warnings. The first one, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. This is the first thing that will happen to us if we join the beast system. Okay, We will be under the wrath of God. Okay, And the second warning comes out here. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now we're going to look at this um, one here first about the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Now the imagery that's used here, the, the wrath is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. When you have a, a drink, um, if it's too strong, whether it be alcoholic drink is, was, was mixed in, in the, the language here, or even if it's just like a cordial, you know, sometimes my kids decide to make a cordial drink and they don't always get the proportions right. And you have a sip of it and it tastes like I'm drinking sugar syrup. It's like, no, no, we need to mix that with more water. It's too strong. But the language here is when God's wrath is poured out, it's without mixture is poured out in full strength. Here is judgment without mercy. God's wrath is being poured out without anything to dilute it. And this gives us an indication of 
when this is looking forward to. What, what is the time frame this is pointing to? When God's wrath is poured out without mixture, undiluted by mercy. This is only happening in that time that we call after the close of probation, when there is no mediator. We read about this in Revelation 15. Revelation 15, verse 8. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So here, it speaks about the, the temple in heaven, the heavenly sanctuary, where right now, Christ is ministering as our high priest on our behalf. Right now, Christ is pleading his blood for the human race. And there is, is mercy being poured out, mixed with every judgment that comes upon us. But Revelation here is looking for a time when the temple is empty, when it's filled with smoke from the glory of God, and from his power that no one is able to enter the temple. The temple is empty. No one is there. Christ is no longer pleading for our case. And with no mediator standing between man and the righteous judgments of God, his wrath is poured out in these seven last plagues without mixture, without mercy, for there is no mediator. Um, and if we jump back to the beginning of chapter 15, we see it actually presents the wrath of God here as being what's poured out in these plagues. Here in Revelation 15, in verse 1, we read, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And again in verse 7, and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. So these seven last plagues that are poured out after the close of probation, when every case has been decided and there is no more mediator, this is the wrath of God being poured out that the third angel's message warned us about. The wrath of God is poured out. So in that warning, God is telling us, to, to have no part in Babylon or in the system of this beast. If you have your part in Babylon, you will have your part in these last plagues, this judgment that is to come upon the world. And it carries on. Once we're presented with the seven last plagues here, in chapter 16, these plagues are poured out. And in verse 1, it's introduced as this. He says, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So this is at the commencement of the last plagues. The commandment is to pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And now we're going to jump to the end of chapter 16 and look at the seventh plague, the final plague that is poured out. We read this in verse 19. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the city of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. This is the same language we read in Revelation 14 with the third angel's message. This warning of the drink of the, the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath that is poured out without mixture in its full strength in this time of the close of probation. And so this warning is clear. It looks forward to the time to come. And it warns, do not be a part of this system. Do not join with Babylon or you will have your part in these plagues. Um, and now we're going to jump back to Revelation uh, chapter 6. This also mentions that the, the wrath of God is in the, um, in the seals. Okay. Uh, Revelation 6, beginning in verse 15, we read, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So again, we have all the people on the earth that joined with the system of Babylon, all the people of the earth that received that mark and worshipped the beast in his image. They're all here crying for the rocks to fall on them. Why? Because they are seeing Christ coming in his glory. 
They are seeing the face of him that sits on the throne and the wrath of the lamb has come. They're here at the second coming and they say this is the great day of his wrath that has come. So again, here as well, it puts the day of God's wrath at the second coming of Christ. There's these final events that are to happen. Um, and interestingly, if we jump back into Revelation chapter 14, once the three angels' message are given, this final message to the world, this message of the everlasting gospel, of, of the warnings of what comes by rejecting it, a warnings against the system of Babylon, the next thing we read in chapter 14, verse 14, is a picture of the second coming. We read, and I looked and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud, one sat like unto the son of man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand, a sharp sickle. So following the third angel's message, we're given this picture of the Son of Man coming back to, to harvest the earth, to, to bring the saints home. Christ coming in the clouds to redeem his own. And as the chapter carries on, it talks about he puts a sickle in and he harvests the earth and all the, the righteous saints are gathered to him. But then there's another harvest of the wicked. And we find that in verse 19. And it says, and the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vines of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. Again, talking about the winepress of the wrath of God is where the, the, these wicked are thrown at the second coming. Okay? They're, they're thrown into the winepress of the wrath of God and it's, that it's trodden underfoot and that the blood rises to the horse's door. At this time, when Christ comes to redeem his own, this wrath of God is put this side of the second coming that they face during this time of the close of probation. And one more verse we're going to look at this. When it speaks about the wine press of the wrath of God being tripped, it also uses this language in Revelation chapter 19, when it talks about the, the battle of Armageddon, when the, the nations of the world are gathered to fight against Christ that is coming. We read this, starting in verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dripped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of, the, of almighty God. And he hath on his vestures and on his thigh and name was the king of kings and lord of lords. So again, we're given another picture of the second coming of Christ. And as he returns, it talks about him treading the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God. So we've seen this in, in chapter 6 and chapter 14, 15 and 16 and 19 here. The time of the wrath of God is in that after that close of probation with the pouring out of the plagues and culminating at the second coming of the Christ and the final the destruction of the wicked before that thousand years and before the final judgment. So when we look here, the third angel's message opens by identifying the worship of the beast in his image and receiving the mark as being the issue. And this first warning deals with the judgment, the wrath of God that is poured out, leading up to and at the second coming of Christ. But the second part of this warning, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. This speaks of events that, that don't transpire at the same time. This here is a second part of this judgment. This, this warning has two parts. It warns us about what's going to happen during the plagues to be safe from that. But also this one talks about torment, fire and brimstone, forever and ever, and no rest day nor night. Now, if we look at those four, those four phrases, we find that again mentioned in Revelation 21. That is after the millennium, after Christ has come, 
and this earth has been destroyed and the saints have been taken up to heaven to live and reign for a thousand years. After that thousand years, the city of God, New Jerusalem, descends to earth and there is a second resurrection, a resurrection of all those that were lost. We can pick this up in Revelation 20, verse 9 and 10. And speaking of those that are part in the second resurrection, the, those wicked that were lost, it says, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. And they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So here in this judgment, we find the same language in that second part of the third angel's message. It's warning us about this final judgment and the lake of fire with fire and brimstone, tormented day and night forever and ever. And here we find the devils cast into this lake of fire. And a few verses later, we read, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so here we have these two warnings. Warning is that, that if we join with the system of Babylon, if we worship the beast in his image and receive his mark, then we will suffer the plagues, the wrath of God poured out at the second coming and the second death at the final judgment. This is, this is quite a, a serious warning. The more I was studying this, the more I was realizing how sort of complete the, this judgment is, complete this warning is. It's saying that if we join with Babylon and have our part with Babylon, we will have our part in the plagues and we will die the first death at the judgment of God at his second coming. And then we'll take part in the second resurrection to die the second death in the lake of fire. This is a strong warning and a serious warning. And as I was sitting there contemplating this, I had to ask the question, why is this warning so serious? Why does he give such strong emphasis in that it talks about being punished with the first death at the second coming and the second death in the lake of fire? It puts both these warnings in this message. Why so serious? Why such a strong warning? Um, and when I was going through it, I, I started looking through the book of Revelation about Babylon. Why do we need such a strong warning against Babylon. And if you read here in, in Revelation 17, um, this is John shown this woman riding the beast, and her name's Babylon. Okay, and I want to notice what it says here about the, the kings of the earth. Okay, starting in verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest, the ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings, one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb. And as we know, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So we're given the clear picture that the saints with Christ will overcome this. But I want to notice the relationship between Babylon and the kings of the earth. Okay. The kings of the earth are told that they have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto this, this beast. Okay? Um, and I find that interesting. The kings of the earth, okay, the, the government, the rulers of our world, willingly give their power to this Babylonian system, to this beast power. It's something they chose. It's not something they were forced into. So here we have the kings, that the rules and governments of this world willingly choose to be a part of this Babylonian system, of this beast power. And now we're going to jump over uh, to Revelation 18, and we're going to find a similar thing. In verse 9, we read, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived uh, deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Now, in Revelation 18, it starts off with Babylon being judged, okay? And then it's describing all of those that, that, that are crying and weeping and mourning. And it says the kings of the earth, when they see Babylon's judgment, they're sad, they're mourning, they're grieving. They didn't want Babylon to be destroyed. 
When the Babylonian system is wiped out, the governments aren't relieved that finally they're free from this oppressive power. They're sad that this oppressive power is gone. They wanted to be a part of that system. And then in verse 11, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. So not only the kings of the earth were willingly chose to be a part of the system and wanted Babylon, the merchants of the earth, the businesses and corporations of the earth wanted Babylon. They wanted to be a part of that system. So you know, the governments, the businesses and corporations are all wanting to be a part of the system of Babylon. They think it's good. They want it. And they are sad, devastated and mourning when it is destroyed. Now we're going to jump uh, back into Revelation uh, 13. We read this. Uh, this is the, the second beast that arises in Revelation 13. I want to notice um, what the people are doing when this beast is reigning. Okay? In verse 14. And de deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. Now, I want to notice here, it's not the beast power here that makes the image. The beast deceives the people. And what do the people do? They are the ones that make this image. The beast is deceiving the people that they should make the image. And so it is the people that dwell on the earth, the average citizens here, that choose. Yes, they've been deceived into it, but they still willingly choose to make this image of the beast, to be part of the system. So we've got the governments of the kings of the earth, the governments, the merchants, the businesses and corporations, and here, those that dwell on the earth, the average citizen, all choosing to be a part of this system, all wanting to create this system and to be a part of it. And when I saw this, I was just, I sort of just sat there and it was sort of a little surprising to me looking from, from, from my point of view, looking from the Bible, understanding Babylon and how terrible it is, it was confusing about how so many people would want this to come in. But to all these people, this seems like a good thing. They want this. And that's why God's warning has to be so strong against it. His warning is loud and it is clear and it is certain because this system is so enticing and so deceptive that the whole world, the governments, the corporations, and the average people are following after it, and they want it. And so when this, this mark of the beast is coming, when these, these Babylon powers is taken over the world, it's going to come in by popular consent. It's going to sweep across the world, and I think this is one of the reasons why... We, we have this understanding that the final events will be rapid ones because there isn't going to be massive worldwide pushback against this system when it comes in. The governments want it, the businesses and corporations want it, and the average people want it. And so it's going to come in and sweepingly fast, and we're going to be surprised about how quickly the times are changing around us. Um, and so the next question I have is, how did Babylon manage to convince the entire world to join it? We're going to jump back to Revelation 18. This, this fourth angel's message. Um, we're studying verse 2, and I want us to notice what it says. It says, and he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and a hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now, I want to notice here that the kings of the earth and the merchants of the earth, what, what is their relationship with Babylon here? Okay, they, They've joined with her. As I saw before, they wanted to be a part of this. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have followed after the riches. Babylon seduced them to follow her. 
And if you're familiar with the book of Revelation, um, you probably notice a, a similarity between Jezebel found in chapter two and the message to the church at Thyatira, who seduces those to commit fornication with her. Speaks of the church age when Babylon arose. But here, Babylon is, is getting the merchants and the kings of the earth to come on board through seduction, through uniting with her for power and for riches. Okay, so the, the kings being the governments, the merchants being the businesses and corporations, join Babylon. They're seduced to join Babylon through, through power and riches. At the end of chapter 18, we read, and the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. So the first way Babylon gets people to join is through seduction, through the promise of power and wealth. The second way is through deception. It says, through thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Babylon deceives the world, seduces the rulers, deceives the world. And the third way, well, actually back in chapter 13, we read this before, about how the beast deceives those that dwell on the earth to be a part of the system. Okay, but after it's deceived as many as it could, after it's seduced the kings and the merchants and deceived as many in the world as it could, there's a third step that it takes. Carry on in verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he Causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So the system of Babylon gets the world on board, firstly, by seduction, then by deception, and finally, by compulsion. By compulsion and coercion. Those who have not got on board uh, are cut out of society economically. They can't buy or sell. And as we've seen, the, the, the governments, the kings of the earth, are already on board. They want to be a part of the system. So they're going to carry out Babylon's wills to, to cut those out of society who don't. The businesses and the corporations, the merchants of the earth, they're on board with the system. So they're very happy to not sell to you or not allow you to work for them unless you're a part of the system. And the people on the earth, they've chosen to join the system as well. They're just deceived into creating this image to the beast. They're not going to stand up for us. And often when we talk about the Babylon in the end times, we, we focus very much on this, uh, the, the compulsion aspect of, of Babylon. But I want us to understand that 90% that or maybe, 90, maybe 99% of people join Babylon because of, dis, uh, because of deception and seduction. Okay, the kings of the earth and the merchants of the earth joins because of seduction. The people that dwell on the earth join because of deception. It's only a very small minority that face compulsion and coercion. Okay, most of the world was a willing participants in this. And because of that, we have the third angel's message finished in with this statement. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. God's people are called to live through this time. And what is asking them to have patience, to patiently endure these things and to hold on to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This idea of this, this patience of, of, of the saints, you know, the message starts out in the first angel's message, the everlasting gospel that is to go to all the world. And we're given the certain truth that is to be preached to give the gospel its context at this time. But the second angel's message tells us that Babylon is fallen. The Babylon is fallen comes in response to the rejection of the everlasting gospel, of that first angel's message. As so the Babylon starts with a rejection of the truth, a corruption of it, and counterfeiting the point of the truth. But, but through this time, God's people are still to endure and preach the truth faithfully. And as we continue to do that, Babylonian oppression grows. 
The whole world joins in them with their rejection of the truth and their hatred of those who do not accept it. The kings of the earth, the merchants, the government and the businesses join with them and the people that dwell on the earth join with them. And so in this time, when this mark of the beast is enforced, where everyone is worshiping the beast in his image and following them, God's people are called to endure this time with patience, holding on to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, this idea of having patience is also found in Revelation 13. In verse 7, we read, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindred and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. So again, this is talking about this oppressive beast power. The world is wandering after them. Everyone except God's elects. Everyone except those who are saved, have their names in the Lamb's Book of Life, will follow this beast. I want to notice, it drops this line here. If any man have an ear, let him hear. That phrase, we should all pay attention when it says that. I think the first time that that's used, Jesus is speaking in the Gospels. And his teaching in parables. And his disciples saying, why are you doing this? And he says, because to you, it is given to know the secrets of the kingdom, but to those who are without, it's not. And he quotes from Isaiah. That there are those who have ears to hear, but they can't hear, and eyes to see, but they can't see, and a heart, but they can't believe. Okay, this message is for those who have an ear to hear, those that are willing to hear and follow what they hear, that are willing to accept what God says. And so it drops the sin for, for all of us to pay attention to. It. And it says during this time, it says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. And he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Those who are going to lead us into captivity, there will come a time when they shall be led into captivity. Those that are persecuting us will be destroyed. Okay, that's what that warning message in the third angel's message was saying. Not only is it actually a warning to all those who would join themselves to Babylon and the system of the beast, it's also letting the saints know that when they are enduring this time of persecution, with patience that will not last forever, that the judgment will come, that those who are killing us with the sword, that those who are persecuting us, that those who have cast us out will themselves be cast out, led captive and killed with the sword. That God will come in judgment. But during this time, we are called to have patience, the patience and faith of the saints, that that is what we need to hold on to. We find this again under the fifth seal in Revelation 6. Uh, beginning in verse 9, we read, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them, that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So here we have the voice of the martyrs crying out for justice. Look, how long is this going to carry on? And God says they need to endure with patience. Those that have fallen asleep, those that have paid the martyrs sacrifice and that have been killed for their faith in Christ, their reward is sure. And it's saying they're going to rest a little while. They will awaken the resurrection. But the fellow brethren and their fellow servants need to endure with patience for a little longer until that time is fulfilled. So when God calls us to have patience, it's because there, there are these times that we're going to go through. And he tells us that he can get us through these times. 
whether or not we, we will live on earth to see Christ coming or whether or not he'll carry us safely to the other side of death and will rise in the resurrection. We are called to endure these times with patience, holding on to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I just want to finish with, with Hebrews 11. Whenever we're talking about holding on to the faith, I always jump to Hebrews 11. In, in verse 24, it speaks about Moses' faith. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, I find how Moses' faith is presented here to be extremely applicable to the situation. You know, Moses, he was called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He, he was part of the royal family. Okay, he, he could have ascended to the throne to rule over all of Egypt. Okay, but it says he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure in Egypt. So that this oppressive power could not seduce Moses to join it through the, the prospect of power and riches. And I find that interesting because Babylon seduced the, the kings and the merchants of the earth to join it through the promise of power and riches. That was seduced, but Moses here was not seduced by anything that Pharaoh could offer, or anything that Egypt could offer, because he had esteemed, esteemed the reproach of Christ's greater riches in the treasure of Egypt. He had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He knew that the riches of the kingdom of God was more than anything that Egypt could offer him. But I want to notice here, it's not just talking about the, the riches of heaven and that final reward. He actually esteemed the reproach of Christ, greater riches in the treasure of Egypt. And, and that's something that stood out to me. The reproach of Christ was of greater riches, not necessarily the, not the reward of the resurrection being of greater riches, but the reproach of Christ of greater riches and all the treasure in Egypt. And this is something that strikes me whenever I read any stories about the martyrs and testimonies of those that were persecuted for Christ's sake. Um, I always find myself sort of looking at them in, in almost admiration for, for what they have because in those stories I find someone speaking about a relationship and a connection with Christ that it, it is so deep that couldn't have come any other way you find stories of people standing in the face of certain death with this peace that passes understanding and I look at that that closeness they have with Christ who has promised that he will be with us always, even into the end of the world, that they've drawn so close to their comforter that that relationship that they have developed through persecution, through suffering reproach for his name, that relationship with Christ is of greater riches than anything this world can offer. That peace that passes understanding, to be that close to the one who has saved you and walks with you. Moses esteemed of that of greater riches than all the treasure in Egypt. So Moses was not seduced by this oppressive power because he knew the rewards that awaited him. He was not deceived by this oppressive power because he had that relationship with Christ because he grew close to Christ and, and knew him. And he could not be coerced or compelled or, or suffer under compulsion from this oppressive power. Because it says here, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, but he endured as seeing him who was invisible, because his eyes were fixed on heaven. He knew God was guiding him and leading him. And so no amount of compulsion or coercion could lead him to join with this oppressive power. And so, the, the, as we saw, the three ways Babylon got the world to join them was through seduction, through deception, and through compulsion. But here Moses' faith was not going to be brought into join with this oppressive power, this oppressive governmental force through seduction, deception, or compulsion, because he grew close to Christ. He knew the true riches that lied in that relationship with Christ, that that was better than the world could offer. 
whether it was being cast out and had to flee in the desert for 40 years as a shepherd, leaving everything he had behind, that's fine. That's fine with him. It, it reminds me of that song, Give Me Jesus. You know, the line of that, you can have all this world, but give me Jesus. You know, you, you, can, you can take everything away from me, but as long as I have Jesus, I have greater riches than anything this world can offer. Okay, T take my job, take my ability to buy or sell, just give me Jesus. Okay, take my safety, persecute me, cast me out, I don't care, just give me Jesus. Okay, that's the faith Moses had. That's the faith God's people are called to have under this third angel's message. This message where God's people are called to endure with patience, the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus.